What's up guys and gals and welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be taking a look at a title called Great Houses of Caldaria. This is a game that I've actually enjoyed. I've played it for the last three or four hours and while I'm normally not a grand strategy guy, I think this one works because it's actually a little bit of a trading simulator too. Like this is kind of like Crusader Kings. If Crusader Kings was focused much more heavily on like economics, I suppose, and like moving objects around and having things that you need in order to advance, there's also a pretty hefty RPG narrative element to it as well. Although I don't think that holds up quite as well in comparison to like Crusader Kings 3, for example, which is basically just an RPG at this point. Uh, but we're going to dive on into Great Houses of Caldaria today. We're going to see if it's something you wanted to add to your wish list or otherwise pass on if you wanted to check this game out it's an early access right now it's down below i've got a link for you on top of that you can also take a look down there if you wanted to find my discord or my twitch stream just in case you wanted to hang out live for right now i apologize if i sound a little stuffy or weird during the course of this video while we're checking the game out for the next 30 minutes or so uh I went to like Thanksgiving and all my little nephews and nieces were running around hacking and coughing like little booger monsters. So unfortunately, uh, I seem to have dragged home a disease from my patient zero little children in my family. So at the beginning of this game, we gotta choose what our house is gonna be called. We will be known as House Boopland. And then we've got to decide what our civic focus is. So in this game, uh, there's kind of like a tech tree and as you make decisions and as you choose to do things, Doing things that are like in alignment with the ideology that lines up with your family will unlock further perks that make your life easier. They'll make like your economic model easier, they'll make war easier, they'll make debate and diplomacy easier, they'll make manufacturing easier, it kind of just depends what you want to do here. It doesn't really matter what you pick, uh, but once you pick it, you kind of want to dedicate to that tree and you kind of want to play the game that way. You can hop in between these traditions if you want to do so in order to swap out bonuses, but you will have to start from like the beginning of the tradition if you hop from one to the other. You'll keep your progress in the one that you already advanced in, but then the new one that you jump on over to, uh, you'll start from the beginning. And so anyways, we'll just go with Peacemakers for right now. Uh, well, maybe not. Peacemakers is for population growth. Uh, this gives you easier happiness, which actually I find that Idealist works pretty well, so we can do that. And then we've got to pick our starting family. Your starting family in this game is going to do the exact same Crusader Kings thing that we're all sort of accustomed to. They're going to have little traits. These traits are going to matter for like their overall stats. Uh, some of the traits will allow them to auto pass certain events and things that come up. Uh, certain traits will cause them to have conflict with other characters that have opposing traits. That kind of thing. So when you're doing diplomacy and whatnot, you kind of always want to be on the lookout for like, what can I do here in order to give myself an advantage? Uh, we want to re-roll this because this family sucks. I just took a look at their stat grid and they're really, really bad. So we're going to do something like that right there. So after a large quantity of re-rolls, I think I've got a stat block that I like. So each of these characters in this game, every single character, yours or opposing characters, they all have four stats. They have diplomacy, uh, they have economy, they have intrigue, and they have military. Uh, these are all going to affect various things in various ways. We'll kind of talk about that once we actually officially get on into the game. But it's a really good idea to make sure that you have like a team of guys that have good stats. Like I can't stress that enough. Uh, it seems like your opponents always have pretty decent stats. So you're going to want to sit here and re-roll for a little while until you get a good stat block. I would recommend the developers allow you to re-roll these guys individually instead of re-rolling all four. It just makes the randomness take too long. And so any- wow, that's really good diplomacy right there. That's a solid diplomacy right there. This is actually not a terrible family. I mean, Elsa's a little bit of a goober. She's not very helpful. But like, we'll just marry her off to somebody that is helpful. Uh, because both of these two are unmarried and in their 40s? Weird. It's okay. The head of our family right here is gonna be reasonably young and still capable of having kids, so I think it'll be all right. It's, we're doing a 35 minute video. How wild and crazy could it get? From there, we've got to decide our coat of arms, our sigil. I've got myself a golden stag on top of like uh, three red crimson lines on top of white. I feel like it looks okay. I don't know. I make little edits in here, but I'm like the kind of person that has to re-roll if I end up not liking my sigil. So I gotta like fiddle with it. And then the final decision we're gonna make before we go on into the game is how long has it been since we arrived in Caldaria? So in this game, Caldaria is like a mysterious island that's off the coast of like somewhere. 
Uh, they've tried to populate it a bunch of times, and it's always gone wrong just due to misfortune or conflict or whatever else. And so the Emperor in the mainland has sent you and a bunch of other counts and dukes and nobles to come over here and settle it for the final time. Uh, earlier settlers get like the flatlands and the hills. Later settlers get mountain ranges and the steppes. These all come with different bonuses. They will also change your map position uh, when you start out at the beginning of the game. So if you're playing as like the hillside or the flatlands folks, you'll probably be off to the east side of the map, the northeast and the southeast. If you go with the mountain range, you're kind of like in the center of the map. And if you go with the steppe, you tend to be further out to the west. Uh, what you pick here matters because it changes what your outputs are going to be, but it doesn't really change the narrative portion of the game. It just depends what your economy is focused on. So, like, these guys get a bonus to their building materials and their metal ore. These guys get a bonus to growing grapes and making wine, which is actually fairly important. These guys get a bonus to crops and population. It just depends what you want. I'm going to go with the hillside, and then we will start with our, we gotta name our country, unfortunately. Well, fortunately, actually, we'll call it Boopistan. Glorious Boopistan. Uh, do you need a tutorial? No, I, I don't much think that I do. I think I'm solid right here. Uh, so this is Baroness Boopland. And if you're used to map staring simulators, map painting simulators, this is gonna be fairly familiar to you for right now. Uh, at the beginning of the game, what we need to do is we kind of need to get our economy in order. Hey, we started out with a baby. A baby male bardo. Nice, dude. That works out. And it seems like he's elegant. He's profligate, which kind of sucks. But he's a bridge builder as well. So he's probably going to have, like, insane diplomacy as he gets up higher. So that'll be nice. Uh, you got all your family members on the left-hand side over here. There's a lot of information being thrown at you. I've played the game for about four or five hours. I have found it to be a satisfying experience. I enjoy it. I'm, in, I'm interested in seeing where the early access goes. Uh, but the things you want to be aware of. Top of the screen. This is your economic readout. These are all the resources that can be produced from any location. So you've got like food, you've got grapes, you've got hammers, you've got leathers, you've got yourself metal ore, you've got horses, you've got wine, uh, you've got steel, you've got luxuries, and you've got parchment and money. And I think this scrolls too. There may be more of them, but I haven't really gotten that far into the game. It hasn't been important yet, but there's arrows on either side, so that seems to imply that either there's more stuff that you can unlock through economic development, or later on down the line, they're going to add more resources that you could play around with. But if we click on Boop Landy over here, it's going to give us a panel. This is probably the panel that you're going to spend the most time looking at while you play the game. Uh, you're constantly going to be fiddling with stuff, and if you've ever seen a game called Lords of the Realm, or another game called Rising Lords, uh, this is going to be really, really familiar to you it's going to look kind of familiar so each one of these see our populations eight out of nine each population is one of these little icons right here and we can click and drag these around to do what we want to do and we kind of want to get everything nice and even right now from where we're at uh, we're going to need hammers to build some things up make our city better there's a hammer menu right here each and every single one of these locations that produces resources has a bunch of different upgrades and a tech tree that goes all the way up that makes it more efficient throughout the game. You're going to have to decide what your principal, like, primary economic output is. Do you want to have, do you want to be like the breadbasket of the empire? Uh, do you want to be a bunch, a bunch of vintners, you know, and turn this whole thing into the Napa Valley? It really sort of depends what you want to do with what you want to do inside of the game. Uh, I do need to figure out, so why are we losing one? We have one leather being consumed. It's weird. Why do we have livestock being consumed? Who's eating up livestock right now? This faction has a different problem than I'm used to. It's fine. We'll take it off crafters because we don't need luxuries anyways. And we'll put them on herds manning. And that should keep us mostly evened off on cattle for right now. We're probably going to want to throw one of our earliest upgrades at this just to knock that number up a little bit and get it nice and even. But for now, we're in okay shape. Uh, one thing you can also do from here is that you're supposed to place family members as advisors over these various industries. And so you can slot in a family member on any of these spots right here. What you want to keep in mind, though, is that if they cruise around and they're doing, like, diplomacy and stuff, they're not going to be giving you the bonuses or the malices that they would normally have while they're in these slots. Uh, the things that matter here 
or when you slot somebody in, it looks at all four of their stats and it determines where you're at here. So like with diplomacy, you'll get a happiness buff to the workers that are working inside of here. Happiness is important because happiness is how you increase your population and get more workers so that you can get your engine running uh, economically. Austerity uh, basically nerfs the wages of the workers that work inside of here. You've also got safety. Uh, foreign spies can try to infiltrate your various industries and kind of like sabotage them if they know you're having a food shortage so that you have to deal with like riots and things like that. Uh, you've also got your military might right here, which your military stat just changes the production output of the location. So we're right to take somebody with like, let's call it a 15 right here. You can see all of their stats are graded. This guy is actually a pretty good administrator, Durant. And so you can see that we got a 2.3 bonus to the amount of food that we're putting out. Uh, it's now much safer. It's getting a 10% bonus on defense against spies. Uh, happiness has been increased by 0.3, so these guys are no longer upset. We're still not growing our population, but we'll get there. Uh, for now, I don't think we really need to assign too many people except for uh, people to run... Things like our... Oh, that's going to downgrade their happiness. Okay, I don't want to downgrade happiness. We got anybody else that's, like, good at diplomacy but also at working? She's okay. Our austerity will be bad. We'll probably have to pay our guys more. Oh, that got us up to happiness. Nice, dude. So we're getting an XP per day. Yay, towards our population growth. We probably don't need that many miners. It feels really unlikely that I need that many miners right now. I just, I don't see it. And so we'll get the miners out of there. We actually don't have access to blacksmiths or anything right now either. This is going to be a very, very interesting start. I think we can get ore smelting if we unlock that guy right there and we'll get the steel smelter. Uh, but what do you do in the beginning of the game? Well, we did the first one. We assign our overseers to the various industries that we need to keep up and running. We also need to make an official visit. Uh, don't ignore these objectives over here because these objectives matter. So the entire point of this game is that you're trying to elevate your family status inside the realm. There's just no way around it. And in order to do that, you follow these steps over here. And as you go through these... It's kind of charting your road to victory and kind of teaching you the things that you need to do in order to take care of business. I think this also increases like your point score, which means you're much more likely to get certain positions inside the Emperor's Court. So let's make an official visit. Uh, it looks like the Moncatos don't really like us very much. It looks like the Valentinias don't like us very much. Uh, the Kudos, we don't like them, but they're neutral about us. The Left Shield is how we feel about them. The right shield is how they feel about us. It looks like the Onorati's. Uh, we're on pretty good terms with them, so let's go ahead and we'll set up diplomacy over here. And we'll set up an official visit from somebody that has a decent diplomacy score. So Krara Bupland is probably a good choice on that front. Uh, by the way, these portraits right here, they're procedurally generated. These are actually, like, carefully layered, and so you can end up with a bunch of characters that all look kind of different. And we also have to set up who we want to meet with. I'd like to even out our reputation with, like, everybody. So let's go meet with Avra Valentinia, and later we'll get Camilla. We'll send her on over there. And what you'll see is, when I turn time back on, you can actually see Avra headed over that way to go confer with our neighbors. And what will happen is when she arrives there, it'll trigger a little RP event. And then we've got to decide on what we want to do, sort of like visual novel style. And as you can see, our economic engine is spinning up. Uh, we're starting to have stuff and things. That's really, really good. The official visit. So, Krara Buplin has traveled to Novergamo and is greeted by Avra. She arranges a formal meeting and asks Krara to name a topic that they'd be willing to discuss during the meeting. We'll probably... So, one thing I like about this game is that it's tooltipped really well. In some cases. Uh, but when you mouse over these options, it tells you flatly like what stat it's going to be looking at to determine whether or not you have a good time here. I would suggest we do maybe collective economy or state of defenses. Let's do military. Uh, Avra agrees that military matters make for a good topic of discussion. Although they have their differences over the rights of fiefdoms to defend themselves, the visit was not in vain. Good. So as you can see, uh, we actually... She did. I probably sent the wrong person, actually. She does not like Avra at all, even slightly. But she's actually fairly positive about us. All right. Fair enough. Now the trip is done. 
And as you can see, we've completed our second task that was important to the realm. Now, the final thing that we need to do for level one advancement is that we need to build a building. So let's go ahead and build said building. I like to look at where I've got the most workers. This little wheel right here, by the way, the longer you leave your workers slotted in, the more of a bonus you get because they get more and more experienced. So really moving people around in industries in this game is a really bad idea. You generally don't want to do that. You kind of want to keep everybody around. But I like the idea of either getting the farmers and the masons a little bit happier. We're not going to be able to do that, though, until we have a wine industry, which leads me to, like, do I develop? So food seems to be in a good place. Our entire economic development seems to be in a good place. And if we go to the Vintners and we start making wine grapes, I feel pretty positively about that idea. It's not an idea that upsets me. And we could take miners off right there and we could take the vineyard bonus on that side. We could swap over a mason to right there. And in swapping over said mason, uh, we would be able to finish this in 50 days. I think it's a good idea because it opens up the winemaker. So let's go ahead and do that. A uh, wine is going to be a secondary resource that you need if you take a look at this menu right here. So there's different levels of wages for your workers, almost in kind of like Anno style. You get huge happiness bonuses for bumping up their wages. So if they're not just getting food, they're also getting wine and luxuries. They'll be much happier, which means that your population levels up faster and you get more little pieces to put on the board to have a better economy. So it's a good idea to start looking at things early that you want to do long term. And like last time I played the game, I was really scrambling early on trying to get the Vintner up and running uh, because I developed too quickly in other directions and I needed wine in order to keep my entire economy afloat. But I had not prepared to pr create wine, so we'll probably just wait 50 days. As you can see down here, the vineyard is being crafted. We should probably also send somebody over to talk to the Moncados. So let's go ahead and do that. So with the Moncados, we can send an official visit of Krara over there. That's your entire family? How is it only you? Is this guy married? Who's he married to? Does he just have, like, a bunch of little children? We're going to have to look at his household. His household is strange. What's going on over here? Huh. They must all just be out of house. I don't know. I took a look at their house, and nothing looks out of order. They've got four or five people that are officially on the registers. Keep that running right there, and we got 50 days until we can knock out the Vintner. A Seed of Doubt. Clavina decides to spend some time in the garden upon arriving at the small greenhouse. Clavina notices that something is amiss. Clavina swears quietly and looks at the small, mysterious flower that has been planted in the middle of his orchid flower bed. So you see how there's an icon on this side? You kind of want to pick the one that matches the tradition that you're a part of. So whether it be isolationism or war or schemers, you kind of want to pick the one that goes along with it because it gives you points in that tree. For right now, though, what I like to do is I like to go through and take a look, and anything that gets underlined when you mouse over this gives you a unique interaction. So let's go with inspect the flower bed, because he's got vengeful. He inspects the flower and makes an interesting discovery. He hasn't seen this flower in a codex of poisonous plants, or he's seen the flower in a codex of poisonous plants. He recollects a conversation with one of the gardeners regarding troublesome individuals. The gardener had pledged to provide Clavina with a potential approach to address the issue at hand. Oh, cool. And so we unlock two new perks that'll be here for like the next half a year. I've seen these little buffs down here. I've seen these go upwards of like 1,800 days. So these events can be really meaningful in terms of like affecting who your character is for like the next 10 years of their life sometimes. This is just a little short one because it was just finding a flower in a flower bed. But more important events do exist. Kara Boopland has traveled to Akante and is greeted by Ciro Moncado. What topic do we want to talk about? Collective economy is good here because she has 19... No. Well, she has a 12 and he has a 15. Let's do that. Trade affairs. Ciro doesn't appear interested in Krara Buplin's suggestion and rarely answers with more than a sentence. The rest of the visit has a lingering, unpleasant atmosphere. Really? All right, so Krara doesn't like him at all. Yeah, but we did get the plus five for a recent visit. It's kind of a bummer. I would rather not have, like, we're really hostile to them. They don't really care about us, and so it'll work out fine. Is that building done yet? The vineyard's done? Oh, nice. We finished off the initial growth quest. So there it is. You completed the initial growth of your fiefdom and 
of your own power. This is the first step in your path to prominence. So really the goal of this game is that you're trying to move up the hierarchy of the kingdom by taking one of these positions. We have no position right now, but in a couple months, every year you kind of get summoned to an island where the emperor addresses all of you, and he decides what titles and accolades he's going to give out. And so you've got ducal ranks, you've got committal ranks, uh, you've got baronial ranks, and you kind of want to grab these because they give you fat buffs uh, to various parts of your society. And also, this is kind of like the goal of the game, is to become like Fist of the Empire, basically, and move up the chain. Uh, you can do that through, these are all the traditions, by the way, in case you're wondering how many of them there are. Right now, we are idealists, and so later on down the line... Uh, we would be able to move to these deeper ones right here if we can accumulate enough idealism points by choosing idealism options in roleplay events. Uh, you can also level up other stuff. You will note uh, that they all have XPs and things under them, so like we've got 8 points in Warrior, for example, from decisions that I've made. As the game plays along, it'll go quicker and quicker. It wants us to make a trade. I don't really know what I need to trade for right now for this next thing. What? Uh, Izan is now middle-aged. Fair. Let's go ahead and view what upgrades we can actually do right now. I think it's a good idea. So we've got our vineyards over here. We are producing grapes. We're doing our thing. We could go over to the winemakers, although I don't particularly know how much wine that's going to produce or how that's going to affect our overhead. So it's going to be a very slow production, unfortunately, of wine, if that turns out to be the thing that we're trying to get our hands on. It's a slow trickle, and it is going to drain our grapes a little bit. I think we can live with it. We can boost that up a little bit uh, by doing something like we've got wine pits over here. Uh, the wine pits... They'll give us a 10% bonus, and they'll give us two more slots. We can't really do rootstock or irrigation yet. We could potentially reassign somebody from food if we wanted to, but it may not be a bad idea either to maybe throw the masons a bone. So we can get a 15% bonus right here if we invent treadwheel cranes. We also get another work slot, and we can boost their wages up to level 2. I think that's a nice bonus to pick up, so I think we should pick it up right now. Let's go ahead and grab that. Our output's going to be a little bit low on hammers. But it'll go up considerably once it's done. So I think it'll be all right. And we're still, like, net positive, so I think it'll be okay. Let's go speak with the Onorati. We obviously have a very nice relationship with them. Everyone gets along, so that should be a nice, easy trip. More like a vacation than anything else. Who's to the south of us? The kudos. All right. Kara Buplin traveled to Boltsatlieri to visit the Onorati family. Helia Onorati greets her warmly. Uh, what should we concentrate on? Let's concentrate on... We have pretty good diplomacy, so I kind of want to focus on a discussion with Helia personally. We could compare our intrigue, but she's much better at it than we are. I don't have any underlying traits that are going to help me with having a good time, but I'll give it a go. Uh... Krara attends a social event, or every social event that she can. It says he can. Uh, performances by minstrels and court jesters, feasts, and informal late-night gatherings with courtiers. Krara has a whole collection of funny stories, and she quickly becomes popular in court. When it's time to go home, her new friends ask her to visit again soon. There you go. Uh, we also need, we have unmarried family members, and I totally forgot about that, so we should probably do something about that. Uh, this is where the wheels kind of fall off with this game. So there's no unified place in this game that you can look at every single character that exists and then filter by various things, like whether they're married or not. Uh, so finding someone to marry in this game can actually be like a giant annoying headache uh, because you've got to go to the view menu over here and then you got to check all their family members. The pop-ups don't pop up fast enough. Like the entire, all of the pop-up menus in this game are like sticky. And there are options if you go to the settings to fiddle with that, but I have not found a way to get them satisfying yet. Like, the way that the boxes pop up and the tooltips pop up is very sticky and weird and annoying no matter what you do with this, no matter what you do with the settings. I don't know. It's been kind of a pain. And so, this game's one major problem to my eye is that anytime you have to find very specific information about another family, 
there's no way to do it except for brute forcing it and just sitting there and staring at menus for a while. They could fix that very easily by having another button right here in the UI that opens up. It has every single family. You click on the family. You know, it's got buttons to go to. It's got like little icons that are like, this family has unmarried males. This family has unmarried females. Stuff like that. Uh, things that allow you to navigate faster. All of something like what Crusader Kings has. Uh, because Crusader Kings, I never really had the issue like finding what I'm looking for when it comes to marrying off a family member or whatever else. This game, I definitely have that problem. Elsa is taking her daily walk around the keep and while resting in a garden, a pure white feline rustles out of the bushes, stretches, and comes to meet Elsa. On closer look, its eyes are white too. Is this a bad omen? How does she greet the little creature? We could try to pet it. We got better diplomacy than everything else. Elsa Booplin's reaction is interpreted hostile and the creature bites her. I should never be so trusting again. Uh, she is now dissatisfied for the next 180 days. I don't know if I, you know, my cat bites me like 400 times a day. He's just generally cranky. And I don't know if it's ever, dis I don't know if it's ever pissed me off for a half a year. Like there's occasionally where I'm like, you know what, you little turd, you get what you get. But, like, I don't think it's ever, like, permanently messed up my year. Well, let's go ahead and talk to the Adela. Let's talk to the Crudos. The El Crudos over here. We'll go talk with the Crudos. Uh, it will give you suggestions as to who you should marry them off to by reputation, basically. I usually just go with that because it's faster. So we'll marry Durant to uh, Quinoa or whatever her name is. Uh, and then Elsa apparently can be married to Lokad Calamaro. He's kind of got, like, bad stats. Another thing they could do, I guess, is put an arrow right here, and it cycles through to all the various eligible bachelors. But for now, just to show you what the game looks like, we'll go ahead and marry everybody off. Uh, Krara decides to pay an official visit to Adela Crudos, or Cuddos, sorry, fiefdom, to discuss safety protocols. The delegation is welcomed warmly, and Adela seems happy to host Krara, who starts to negotiate immediately when the perfect moment arises. Which way should we persuade Adela to improve cooperation? Well, I have benevolent, which means that we could increase the security in our cities. We can agree to share criminal records. Uh, it looks like we can plan together to fortify our borders. We'll go with increased security. Offers a tasty full course dinner while eating car negotiates without hiring a mercenary company to patrol about hiring a mercenary company to patrol in their cities. Adela agrees to this but demands to have all of them work in her city the next three months. Car tries to negotiate better terms for the deal, but then Adela gets annoyed and they both just finish up with the meal. Bummer. We don't like each other now. Killer. Uh, we had kind of a good relationship with them up until that meeting. Oh well, we'll try to fix it later. Uh, Durant has arrived at the court of Ainwa Palemo. So far, Ainwa hasn't shown any interest in Durant, and there are concerns with the delegation that the chances of marriage are slim. What should he do? Well, I mean, I would suggest charming her. We don't really have anything in play right now, though. It worked! Uh, despite Durant's best efforts, Ainwa seems cold and distant. However, after a day of sullen, intense atmospheres, she becomes more open to the idea of getting married in the future. Whispers of the court suggest that there had been a heated conversation amongst the family members of Palemo about Ainwa's childish behavior. Oh yeah, dude, they're talking about shiving her back behind closed doors uh, for not hanging out with us properly. Durant was informed the traveling theater troupe is present at somewhere. Apparently, display bugs galore today. This did not happen during the last three or four hours of me playing the game. Of course, it's going to happen on camera, though. Probably for the best, considering this is helping you decide whether or not you want to buy the game. He decided to use their performance as an excuse to spend time with her. The troupe Commedia Die... Commedia de Calderia relentlessly ridicules the nobility while poking fun at commoners and the burgers in their midst. Einwa watches the performance intensively. And Durant has a hard time interpreting what she might be thinking. After the first act, Durant starts a conversation about the play. Uh, we have good military. And we don't have an auto pass, so we'll go for it. Durant comments the miserable effort of the actors. The critique towards society in the upper class doesn't sink in well with Durant, and he feels that making fun of Commodore's stupidity doesn't carry the story enough to keep him interested to the end. Ainwa agrees. 
about some of the critique, but she liked the actors that mocked the commoners and burgers. They both agree that laughing at the emperor is tasteless and vulgar and should definitely be censored from the play. Oh, good. They're infatuated with each other now. We're moving along. We're moving towards a marriage. I'm trying to complete the marriage cycle because uh, there are things I want to show you with that. Uh, where there is a combat system in this game, and in fact, it's kind of like creative. It's almost kind of like a backgammon type deal that you play for both military conflicts and also for negotiation conflicts, but we're not there yet. A beautiful night cherishes listeners with warm winds and a mesmerizing starry sky cast shimmering lights making the gathering magical. Elsa participated in this event on the request of her family to represent House Boopland and meet with Lokad. While listening to poems about the bane of life, she notices Lokad looking in her direction, smiling invitingly. Should she take a step further and introduce herself? Isn't that what you're supposed to be doing there? Aren't you supposed to be, like, seducing the guy? Write and perform a poem to him. Do it. Oh, it didn't work very much. Tries hard to write anything understandable in the night, and when it's her turn to perform, she has nothing written down and she improvises. It's catastrophic and everyone feels a shared sense of fi Oh no, shame. Bummer. These are the things that happen when we try. You tried your best and you failed. The lesson here is never try. Uh, Sibylla and Izan Boopland are expecting a child. That's good because this game, it doesn't go as far as Crusader Kings does. So you're not going to be playing for like hundreds of years. This game goes for like 80 years and there's definitely like an end game. And there's a time where this game is over basically. And you're trying to basically advance your family as far as possible during that time. We should probably get something up and running here. I personally would kind of like to upgrade the vineyard. It's very expensive to upgrade the vineyard. But we can get resource bonuses. Maybe store up some wine for a little while. Maybe we'll just take them off making the grapes for right now. Or I guess we'll take them off making wine and put them onto making grapes and let that stack up for a little bit. And we'll just keep that in our storage for a while. Some places where the game could use improvement as well. As that, like, sometimes with this right here, it says plus 50% production consumption. It's a little vacuous, I, I guess. So does that mean I'm getting a 50% bonus to my production consumption? Or does that mean I'm getting a 50%, it's consuming 50% more grapes? I would probably go with the second right there rather than the first. And we can't really afford that at the moment with the decision that we're trying to make. But if it turns out to be, like, it's called a dilution chamber. So, like, what if it, like, lowers... The I'm assuming it does the later one, but like some more specificity would be a really good idea right there. Instead of it just saying production consumption, it would be like 50% more grapes consumed. That leaves no shadow of a doubt what's going on because this game oftentimes, you might be saying to yourself, Splat, it obviously means that it costs you more grapes once you have the dilution chamber. You would think that, but there are certain other parts of the UI where it reads backwards just like this, where it sounds like something bad's gonna happen, but then something good happens. So like, I'm just throwing it out there that other parts of the UI have made me question stuff like this before I spend huge resources upgrading things. I suppose I'll take the 20% bonus uh, to producing, actually our food's actually kind of struggling right now. Why is our food struggling right now? With three workers on, we should have much more food coming in than that. We may want to upgrade something with the farmers then. Let's do... Let's let's build them a grist mill. Yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll build them a grist mill real fast. That'll increase our output by quite a bit. And then we'll keep going. But this game does have combat. It does have knights. It also has social combat. Uh, so it's got social combat and it's got military combat. They both kind of have like the same thing going on where it's like a backgammon board. I was hoping I get to show it to you today, but I guess not. Uh, Clavina receives a letter which looks old and traveled. As he opens it, a shiver runs up his spine, seeing that it was an invitation to an important celebration that he has now missed entirely. How should he answer uh, this missed opportunity? Yeah, write an apology letter. Oh, he's got bad diplomacy. We don't have any auto passes here. We'll send a, yeah, we'll send a gift and an apology. We'll try to minimize damage right there. Uh, Clavina reads the letter and realizes that he was involved. Oh, never mind. So he writes an apology letter to the house of Aganaldi for not showing up and adds a small token of peace with the letter. 30 bucks. Uh, we don't really have any money coming in right now. We're going to work on that pretty soon. Uh, you've got to upgrade your keep and like the kind of center of your town in order to make that work out better. I guess we could try with Tarso Barnaby since you shit the bed on the last one. 
Nothing quite like walking on in and committing a terminal case of cringe to really mess up our family's future. Uh, it looks like Durant and Einwa can actually get married right now. They're happy with each other. The child is born. Sibylla is no longer pregnant. She had the child. Very nice. Uh, so we've got a new family member. Perla has no traits yet. Impossible to tell if Perla is going to be any good. But we do have a new character. When Durant gets back here from wherever he's at, we can actually kick off the marriage. So there's our marriage proposal. Now I can actually show you what combat looks like in this game. I made a little edit right there so that you could see what was going on. I skipped probably a good solid chunk of days. Uh, so what happens is when you have a marriage proposal, you can ask this person to join your household or you can have your character join their household, but you lose access to them. They will no longer be an advisor. So it behooves us to get her to join our family so that her family is now weakened and depleted and then has less people to kind of canvas all their responsibilities. Uh, so we will try to convince them to join. It will kick off a social conflict. Uh, there are objectives to this. And so you can set an auto-resolve priority if you're planning on auto-resolving as well. Ooh, they've got six competency. This might be a mess. I might have to sacrifice something here. Uh, but basically, you're going to fight on a game board. There's going to be three game boards. Each game board is going to be for one of these objectives. And if you win the board, you win that part of the debate, basically. Uh, we want to be able to arrange the marriage. That's the really important one to us. We would also like to gain a claim to their title. If we possibly can, that would actually be really helpful. So I'll probably focus on these two boards, and I'll just accept that they're going to put a spy in my household. Uh, so you get advisors. These advisors are literally combat characters on the field of social debate, and you're going to fight each other. Uh, we can auto-resolve. However, we are kind of at a disadvantage right now. Sort of. They've got a really, really good spy advisor. But this is the game board. Uh, combat is also the same way, just with knights and pikemen and cavalry and stuff like that. Basically, the way that this works is that you've got green sections. If you see, you're trying to control all the nodes that have the little X's on them, because those are spawn points for your units. Um, if you can control all four of these on each game board, you win. There's also a rock, paper, scissors mechanic. So you see the little icon for trade right there, or for military, or for spying? Uh, this right here is the wheel that tells you who's strong against whom. So on this side, we would want to have a diplomatic advisor to go and square off with her. And then we'll want this character over here to neutralize that character. There are special abilities and things that will happen as the board game plays out as well. Uh, we need to have a military advisor over here to square off against her. And then we also need to have an economic advisor to square off against him. And then what we're going to do is we're going to strongly... I'm actually fine with seeding that point entirely over there. I want the claim on their title more than anything else. Uh, so we can also capture these little areas right here. And I would suggest that you do. I'm going to keep one person in reserve and we're going to say that we're ready. And this is just push pause now. Uh, so I would like her to spawn right there so that we can overwhelm on a title claim. All right, combat has been joined on that side. So hopefully we have the advantage here. You move out to there. You move out to there. We will capture these areas. Uh, you can at any time click on these guys and they can retreat back to your hand where they will heal. Uh, she's actually getting starched pretty good right there. So we're going to want her to fall back because she's losing. We want those two to fight. We want to keep an eye on what's happening over here. We're winning on that front. It looks like we're kind of slightly winning on this center board, but they're going to reinforce with this guy if they can capture all four spaces, and they will be capturing all four spaces very shortly. And so we kind of want to make hay while the sun is shining here and knock this out. There we go. Add on into that combat. We've actually lost that right there, so we need to start winning elsewhere right this second. Okay, combat has been won right there, so we'll advance. Combat has been won right there, so we'll advance that way. That combat is almost won. We want him to go for that capture point right there, and them to go to that capture point right there. I need that fight to be over very, very badly. Ooh, they're trying to fight back on this side. Okay. Fair. Go ahead and retreat for a second. Do what you're going to do. 
As long as we take this game board, I'm fine. You go ahead and retreat back to my hand. You go ahead and retreat back to my hand as well. Let them cap what they're going to cap over there. They're going to fight back on that side. Not great. But that does provide us with an opening on this side to try to cap. So let's go ahead and do it. Up to there. Up to there. You just hold your ground right there. And you reroute because you've got a bonus to dealing damage. They're going to fight back on that side. But he's weak to her, so she should win. It shouldn't be a problem. All right. The central issue has been settled, so we have the right to arrange the wedding, and she will now join our family. The auto resolve for this seems reasonably fair. I haven't had any major issues with it. Uh, the auto-resolve seems to have been, like, mostly fine. Uh, we need to, like, surround and pound this guy. I don't know what else we're going to be able to do here. But as long as he holds that node right there, there's not much that I can do. So let's go ahead and jump in right there. He's now falling back. Okay. Go up to there. Reinforce. We just need to take that node. That's pretty much it. But they're almost out of combatants, so I think we're good. I like this little mini game. It's pretty fun. I find it enjoyable. Now, uh, you do the same thing for military, except there's way more boards, and there's, like, knights, and there's, like, cavalry, and it's got the same kind of, like... It's got the exact same rock, paper, scissors mechanic going on. So we now have a claim to House Palemo's title, which is huge. That's really, really good. Uh, we also have the right to arrange the marriage, which is tremendously honorable because it means that she joins our family, which means that we now have a new agent. They just lost an agent, so their family just got tangibly weaker. Our family just got tangibly stronger. And that's the beginning of Great Houses of Caldaria. Hope you, hopefully you guys liked it. Hopefully I did a decent job of explaining things and how everything works. I think most of my problems with this game boil down to just UI issues and some of the pop-up tooltips just being weirdly sticky when you're trying to rapidly look for information. Like they don't pop up fast enough. They don't go way fast enough. Like I said, there is an option that allows you to fiddle with that stuff. But I, I can't seem to get it to like a satisfying spot where it feels as good as like other strategy games and so anyways my name is splattercat i sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so that you don't have to i apologize if my voice sounded weird today i'm hopped up and coked out on just an absolute felony quantity of dayquil right now uh, just to get through the video because i'm quite ill but hopefully this helps you decide whether or not you want to get the game i like it it's kind of like a faster paced version of crusader kings i dig it uh for me as a casual kind of grand strategy enjoyer, this is kind of like the perfect sort of Rising Lords game for me. I don't like it when they get too complicated. But I do sometimes like to play a game like this or, you know, like um, Knights of Honor. Some of the more lightweight, uh, I guess, grand strategy games I tend to enjoy. So I'll see y'all later. Thanks for stopping on in. And that's about it. Take care, folks. And that's all I got for you.